Good morning, Ram Nation. We are back with another edition of DNVR Rams Live. I, of course, am Justin Michael, and we are talking about a big CSU victory over San Diego State last night. CSU wins 22 to 19, keep bowl eligibility on the table. I, I hope my voice doesn't sound too rough. I've been very sick these last couple of days, have a gnarly cough. Decent chance I cough a couple of times throughout this, but I'll try my best to mute the mic for your listening experience. Uh, first things first, this is only the third time CSU's beaten San Diego State since 2005. They had lost 10 of the last 12 versus the Aztecs. Six of those were by double digits. This, very much like Boise State, has been a program that has just had the Rams number in recent years. They've been a bully that have pushed the Rams around and they've been a a hurdle that they have not been able to overcome. I understand that this is an Aztecs team that clearly is down. I mean, they're going to finish with their first losing season since 2009. That's year two of the Fairchild era for context, which is just absolutely insane. Um, But at the same time, when you look at this series history, when you factor in that this is a San Diego State team that has been competitive all year. They're certainly flawed, but they have a veteran presence. This is a feat that should be celebrated. Was it closer than it should have been? Without a doubt. Without a doubt, this game was tighter than it should have been. We're gonna get into we're gonna get into all of that. But I just at times I get frustrated when you have a moment of growth and people still take the time to go negative. And I understand that there were things that need to be cleaned up. They had way too many penalties. That fumble in the fourth quarter was brutal because you had a chance to really seal the deal there. Instead, it, it leaves the window open for a comeback. In the end, though, you did a lot of things well in this game. You had a true freshman running back who looked awesome out there. Justin Marshall, in his career debut for the Rams, comes the first freshman running back to go for 100, over 100 yards in his career debut since the early 70s. I mean, that's awesome. It's awesome how the defense played. I just, I don't know. I I get a little confused at times. I understand that it has not been perfect this year and that there have been some really frustrating moments, but on a night where you beat a team that's had your number for the last 15 years, a program that's, you know, been one of the most consistent in the conference, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And it's worth acknowledging, especially when your backs are up against the wall. Obviously, CSU put themselves in this position. You lost three games coming in. They blew games this year against UNLV, against CU, even Utah State to an extent, although that ended up being a a blowout in the end. But this was a a really big moment for this program, I think, just in showing the the consistency that we've been looking for. Um, They've been competitive all year, which has been nice. It's just been frustrating that they haven't been able to pull it out. In this one, were there moments that that were... Oh my God, I'm getting tongue-tied here. Were there moments that were not great? Yes, without a doubt. But in the end, what matters is you pulled out this victory. You live to fight another day. You have a chance to make the postseason. Really happy for the defense, especially. They have played good enough to win these last couple of weeks. I think the run defense has been solid. Guys have been tackling really well in open space. They haven't been getting torched with the big explosive plays repeatedly like they had uh, earlier in the year. And again, where there's some things you need to clean up, yeah, you gave up some plays late. But when you give up less than 20 points, you're putting yourself in position to win. So big shout out to the defense. We're going to get into the keys of the game. We're going to talk about the turning point, player of the game, all that fun stuff. I'll answer your guys' questions. Um, We'll talk more about Justin Marshall, obviously. I do want to shout out the friends over at Game Time. It shouldn't be stressful buying tickets to your favorite events. Game Time ensures that it's not. Get the best deals on last minute tickets. You can save up to 18% with their zone deals. You can see your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. And they're obsessed with helping you find ways to save money on tickets. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, use the code DNVR for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply again. Create an account and redeem that code DNVR for $20 off. Also want to shout out Hero Bread. Guys, the holiday season's coming up. You might be thinking, "Mm, I need to be be watching what I'm eating a little bit. What's awesome about Hero Bread is it's a low-carb option to fit your lifestyle. 
or dietary constraints. Hero Bread has the taste and texture of the normal stuff, but what's awesome is it has fewer calories than the leading national brand, 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving, and it's ultra low in carbs. Right now, Hero Bread is offering the DNVR fam 10% off their first order. Just go to hero.co, use that code DNVR to save on Hero Bread today. That's H E R O.co to save 10% today. All right, let's keep it rolling here. Shout out to everybody in the comments section. I really appreciate you guys for locking in with me on a Sunday morning here. Maybe you got up to watch the NFL game in Germany, but I appreciate it nonetheless. Offensive balance. Man, was it good to see the run game going. Justin Marshall was a huge part of that. He finished this one uh, with 18 carries for 119 yards, one touchdown, averaged 6.6 yards per carry. And what was awesome is it was just really consistent from his very first touch. He comes in, goes 12 yards a pop. His first three touches of his career go for 50 yards. To me, that's the turning point. It's the fifth drive. Justin Marshall comes in. At that point, you're leading 5-0. You got the safety by Mo Kamara earlier. You'd made one field goal at that point. Marshall comes in, immediately sparks the offense. Three carries for 50 yards. They end up having, having to set another field goal. But that's when the offense started to come alive. That's when you saw them start making plays consistently. And it was just... It was huge to get that true freshman going. I want to talk about just why it took a while for him to see the field. And I, again, I had to cover this game remotely because I'm ill. So I did not have a chance to, to pick the the brains of the coaching staff on this one. But from what I know, you have veteran ru running backs on the roster, both of which were expected to be in the all-conference mix, Avery Morrow and Kobe Johnson. Obviously, injuries messed up that plan. But at the beginning of the season, you know, you're moving forward as if you're going to have a fourth and a fifth year guy to lean on. You're not giving those first team reps to an 18 year old that had been on campus for a month. He's still trying to learn the playbook. He's still learning to, to even be what it's to even know what it's like to be a college student. I mean, it's just it's so much going on at that point. And I think that at times people think running back is just. Well, you go back there, they, they hand you the ball and you run forward. No, you've got to learn your reads. They've got to be able to trust you in pass protection. There's so much that goes into that. And, you know, maybe we could have saw him a little bit sooner than we did. But at the end of the day, you can't put a young running back out on the field before he's ready. That's just asking for disaster. And I've been a little surprised at how many people don't seem to understand that. Like, he looks great. He looked like Marshall Falk out there. As uh, Jacob says in the comment here, the way he hit the gaps, cuts with speed, dodges tackles. I mean, he looked so fluid in the open field and it was consistent. He runs hard for a guy that's, you know, like 5'11", 175. I just, I, I want to iterate, reiterate that while I, I get that it, it looks weird when you see a guy be that explosive the very first time we see him, it's easy to question, well, why weren't they doing that sooner? It's not that simple. And like to an extent, I think some people are looking at it through the lens of, well, they were trying to save the red shirt and not win games. It's a balance. When you had the veteran running backs, you didn't want to necessarily burn these young guys' red shirts, especially before they're ready. You're trying to build for this year, but you're also trying to look towards the future. It's this weird fine balance. But what's great about the situation now he can play in these final two games and a potential bowl if the Rams, and that's a big if at this point, knock on wood, are able to reach the postseason. He can play in all these games and still keep his eligibility intact for this season, which is huge. Would it have been great to have him all year? Without a doubt, if he was ready. But that was not the case. And if it would have been, he would have been out there. And I just think Madden has made us all oversimplify this game. They're not robots. You don't just put them out there and they execute, boom, bang, boom, football guy, I'm good to go. I just, it, it takes time. That's all I'm saying. It takes a little bit of patience every now and then. And I understand that given the lack of success, it's hard to be patient at times, but you get him out there when he's ready and he makes the most of it. Now you hope that he's able to build off of that moving forward. That offensive balance as a whole, though, it was so important. I, I don't think they win this one without a big night from Justin Marshall. 
maybe Van Shield or, or Avery is able to, you know, pick up a, a little bit more of that slack there. Shield was running hard. He unfortunately had the the fumble in the fourth quarter where he leaps up trying to hurdle a guy. The defender makes a phenomenal play on the ball, knocks it out of his hands. Kind of hate leaving your feet in that instance. It's just, it's really dangerous for very minimal gain. Not a lot of, you got to assess the risk reward there, but I just think this was huge. And I think this was quite honestly, a result of CSU being stubborn over this last month and refusing to abandon the run. It, it, it took a while. This O-line has been great in pass pro throughout the year. They haven't been stellar, you know, in, in the run game. There have been times where, where backs have been the issues too. You know, sometimes a guy is going to miss a hole, maybe doesn't get to the edge quite soon enough. I think this was, you know, kind of the result of 11 weeks of work and not just a situation where it's like, all we had to do was play the freshman running back and the running game would have looked like this all year. I just don't believe that would have been the case. It was really, really big that they were finally able to get it going, especially because the passing offense was pretty erratic. Braden Fowler Nicolosi, not his best night. He just looked amped out there. He was skying a lot of balls. The touch wasn't there. Uh, to his credit, I, I felt like from a game management perspective, his decision making was great. I did, I thought a lot of the throws he made, the decision was right. He missed some of them, but the decisions were right. He wasn't putting the ball in harm's way. He did have one in the middle where he kind of tried to force it. I think it was to Holker and Cody Moon, really good linebacker for San Diego State, jumped it, nearly had a pick. Other than that, though, the decision making, it was spot on. He's just got to clean it up and, and hit some of those throws. And Again, it's easy for me from, you know, watching on TV to be like, he missed it here. Sometimes, you know, the receiver didn't keep running. Sometimes it's just a little off in terms of the timing, but he definitely missed some open guys. There was an opportunity to hit Torrey deep early on. Other times on third down, he just kind of threw a fastball. The commentators were talking a lot about that. He's a young buck and it's, it's going to be a roller coaster at times. There's going to be some highs. There's going to be some lows. What I love is that he has the arm talent. He has the confidence. And I think he's learned from his mistakes this season. You know, there are, there's still going to be moments where that, that red shirt freshman comes out in him. But I, I do think that his talent is, is significant. And I think that it's been big for him to continue to get these reps, both when things are going well and when things are going negative. That's about, that's a big part of developing as a quarterback is it just, learning how to ride the wave and, you know, not getting too high, not getting too low, keeping the keys to the game, moving a third down CSU nine to 17 on third down, but they were five of seven on third down in that second half night and day from what we saw against Wyoming where they did not convert on third down once the entire game. That's huge. <laughs> really pretty simple. Sometimes we act like this is rocket science football. If you score in the red zone, if you execute on third down, if you get off the field on third down, defensively, good things are going to happen for you. They won the third quarter, finally. Third quarters have been house of horrors for CSU over the, or a house of horror. You probably don't want to say house of horrors. That sounds like something else. <laughs> um, they finally won the, the third quarter, finally, barely, barely, seven to three, but they scored a touchdown. And as I credited BFN earlier, along with the run game, which really wore San Diego State down, they've struggled against the run all year. Again, I think and actually I know based on some of the interactions I've had on Twitter this morning, there are people that are going to look at this one game and draw too vast of conclusions from it. San Diego State's gotten gashed on the ground all year, all year long, but it was still great to see the Rams get it going. It was big with them being able to run the, the clock out, obviously. I mean, you're a little bit nervous there when you, you're up three after San Diego State had scored 16 straight points. You get the ball back with just over two minutes. The Aztecs still had two timeouts remaining. You need basically a first down to seal the deal. And to Avery Morrow's credit, picks up seven yards on third and four, able to slam that door shut. I think the, the fact that it's Avery out there at the end of the game speaks volumes to the trust this staff has on him. He also was the back that got the carry on fourth and one on the uh, touchdown scoring drive in the first half. Again, saw some weird stuff on Twitter this morning about Moro not wanting it enough. I just, I, I don't get that at all. Most guys in his position 
would be out for the year. He's absolutely tough as shit playing his heart out out there and he's limited. Yeah. You know, he doesn't have that same getaway speed that we saw a year ago because he's injured, but this team has all the faith in the world of, in him. He is a leader in that locker room and he's going to continue to be a part of the offense. Just some really weird takes. Um, more keys to the game. Ben, don't break defense. He held them to field goals early on. That was huge. Pretty conservative effort from Brady Hoke. Can't be stoked as an Aztecs fan with the direction of that football program. It's just gotten really stagnant. It's why my preseason bold prediction was that Hoke would actually get fired. I, I'm not rooting for it. I don't have anything against him or anything like that. It's just, it's kind of like Wyoming where they have this ceiling they can't get over. I, it just, I don't know. I, I just have a hard time seeing him back. We'll, we'll see there, but I was impressed with the way the defense was you know, able to get some big stops early, especially against a team that has a big athletic physical quarterback in Jalen Maiden. He did get the rushing touchdown in the second half, but he's a guy that can really kill you if you let him, and the Rams did a good job of keeping him contained. They did a good job of consistently sending pressure and putting them in you know, second and third and long, forcing Maiden to have to beat you as a passer. If you can do that consistently, it's going to be tough for San Diego State. Big kudos to that defense. And even, you know, when they started to to make some plays, San Diego State, I mean, you know, you see the Rams give up the touchdown, the Aztecs go for two, CSU gets the stop, then they call face mask. And again, the penalties remain a problem for this team. They get a second attempt, they get a stop again, much like the goal line stand uh, a week ago. Just some encouraging stuff regarding you know, def- uh, defending the field in short situations. Player of the game, I think it's got to be Justin Marshall, right? Freshman running back, 18 carries for 119 yards. One touchdown. I mean, true freshman out of Merrillville, Indiana. Had a, a ton of Big Ten interest. They had some ACC interest. Uh, Big 12 as well. Coming out of high school, he's from a really small town. This is a guy who's He's got some juice. I mean, you see that explosiveness. You see how fluid he is in the open field. The vision was great. I love the quick cuts. And then the burst to be able to not only make that cut in the hole, but then hit the ground running and and leave that defender in the dust. He is really intriguing. And when you look at the future between him and Damian Henderson, I think Van Shield will will still be a part of that, that running back rotation as well. He's earned his spot on this team. Did cost them tonight with a couple fumbles, but a uh, big, big game for Justin Marshall. Hope to see them build off of that moving forward. Was a great sight. Was really encouraging to see him out there. Uh, we're going to keep this rolling. I'm going to get to your questions and comments. I uh, hear coming up in that third segment some helmet stickers, some individuals worth recognizing before we do. You've got one to the entire offensive and defensive line. The Rams won this game in the trenches, guys, and. That's not something they've been able to do against the Aztecs very frequently over the years. They ran the ball down their throat defensively. They stopped the run pretty well for most of the night. Did give up some some big runs that kind of inflated the stats at the end. But overall, again, if you hold them to 19 points, you're doing your job. And they were able to bend, don't break in a lot of those instances. When the Aztecs were able to get close, you're able to hold them to three. Big, big night for the O-line. Big, big night for the D-line. I'm going to give a helmet sticker to BFN. I know that he missed a lot of throws in this one. I know that he didn't have any touchdowns, but he managed the game. He he did what he needed to, and he didn't put this team in harm's way when they had a lead down the stretch. He just he showed a lot of maturity, especially when he didn't necessarily have his A game. Oh man, got a comment here from Mark. I guess well, let's just do this one right now, and then we'll do some more comments in the third section. Uh, thoughts on Boise axing Avalos. Not surprised that it happened. Surprised that it happened today. They need to go. They still need a win for bowl eligibility. They go to Utah State this weekend and they host Air Force. Neither of those are gimme wins. Kind of what that implies to me is that Boise is basically saying that we don't care about a six and six finish. Even if you do pull out that bowl, this is not where the program is supposed to be. Yeah, a little surprised on the timing, though, uh, though I guess it is that weekend. Steve Adazio is a former boss, Jimbo Fisher, now out at Texas A&M as well. Crazy, crazy day. Shout out to everybody here in the comment section. Uh, my guy Taylor, sorry I'm late. It's all good, bro. 
it is all good. Uh, keeping it moving with the helmet stickers. Got to, oh, I'm sorry. I, I kind of got distracted there. BFN, <laughs> you know, not his best game, but I, I thought from a decision making standpoint, from a mentality perspective, really solid. And I think this is one of those games where even though the, the stats weren't great and there are some things he needs to, to clean up with those throws, you like the, the direction he's heading in terms of maturity. You know, confidence is never going to be that kid's issue. It's just reining it in at times. And that can be a bit of a process because you also, you don't want him to be gun shy either. Like that confidence and the willingness to throw it up and give his guy a chance is also a big part of what makes him great. And what that means is he is going to turn the ball over at times. That's going to happen. I think the the throw at the end of the first half was really indicative of his mindset. It, there's a pretty good chance that's going to be a pick when you're just throwing it into the end zone like that late. Some guys won't even bother because they're too worried about their stats. They don't want their you know, completion percentage to get impacted. BFN, he's saying, screw it. My guys are better than your guys. I might draw a flag. We saw CSU draw a couple of pass interferences in this one. I, I like this mentality. Again, he needs to execute a little better. But I, I liked his mentality and the fact that he didn't get rattled, especially, you know, having the, a couple of drop snaps early on and missing some throws that it, it could have been a night that that turned ugly. And I thought that he looked really composed in that second half, which was which was encouraging. Uh, Justice Ross Simmons, he led the Rams with 89 receiving yards in this one, continues to um, show some growth, the sophomores really going to be a big deal for this offense moving forward. And I'm right here with you. CD sticks for BFN. The talent is there. Just needs some seasoning and off season. will do him wonders without a doubt. It will be interesting though, to see kind of what happens in spring there. I know the staff is really high on Jackson Brousseau as well. I think it'll be those two that battle it out with BFN, assumingly kind of having the, the advantage going in. Tori Horton, not a huge game, but this dude is so tough. The fact that he continues to play week after week, I mean, I, I think the the biggest compliment I can give him is that he's like a 1990 Honda Civic. And, and I mean that in the most respectful way possible. Jay said after the Wyoming game, a lot of receivers, they're like sports cars. They got to be perfectly fine-tuned to go. Otherwise, they can't operate. You know, sports car, oh, this little thing's out of line. It can't run. Oh, this little thing in the engine. 1990 Civic, doesn't matter if that check engine light is on, you're low on oil, the, the tires need air, you're still going forward for another 50,000 miles. And what's cool about Tori is he has the talent of a sports car, but he has the dependability of that 1990 Civic. And I, I just have the utmost respect for him. I knew, the, I knew the guy was special coming into this year. We all saw it last year, but I've just I've gained a, a different perspective with how big of a team player he is, how just humble and gracious he is and how hard of a worker he is. Cause there are, there are a lot of guys, especially in his spot who could, you know, very easily throw in the towel, start looking forward to the NFL future. And I just have so much respect for Tory Horton. I really cannot state that enough. Uh, we got a helmet sticker for Dallin Holker. Mackey finalist had seven. Oh, good Lord. Led the team in receiving yards, had his seventh overall touchdown of the season. Man, this, uh, this cough medicine is getting to me. Uh, Henry Blackburn led the team in tackles, really, really flying around out there, had the biggest hit of the night. They reviewed it for targeting, and if they would have called him for that, I would have absolutely lost it. He had a sack on third down, which was huge, great safety blitz. Had a, a play to stop a two-point conversion. I actually thought it might have been a pick in the back of the end zone. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Wouldn't have mattered, but it was a great play on the ball either way. Uh, Mo Camara picks up his 29th sack, now only four away from tying Clark Hagans for the all-time school record. I want to shout out Dom Morris as well. He's really stood out to me these last couple of weeks, particularly with the way he's coming up and making stops in the run game. He's not the biggest DB in the world, but he's a really good form tackler. Uh, he he shows no hesitation to get up in the their business and make a play. It's it's encouraging. There's a lot of these young guys that are that are really popping, you know, Marshawn Oxley as well. Again, we gave the entire D-line a, a helmet sticker, but I did want to uh, make sure that I shouted out some of these guys individually as well. 
before we get to some more questions and comments, before I wrap it up with some final thoughts, I'm not sure how much longer my voice is going to last here. I do want to shout out our friends over at Breckenridge Brewery. Breck Brew has a beer for any occasion. They've been doing it for 33 years. It all comes down to their love and passion for making good beer. I'm a big Avalanche Amber Ale guy, but Broncos game tomorrow coming up. Maybe get some Broncos country. It's got a sweet logo. The vibes are right right now. Check out the Breck Brew locator at breckbrew.com to find a brew near you. I also want to talk to you guys about Saturday Neon. It's a local company started by college roommates, uh, really good friends. They're Denver-based. And they make officially licensed collegiate logo LED neon signs. If you've been to the DNVR bar, we've got both a Buffs and Ram sign. What's cool now is they actually offer uh, smaller options. So if you need one that you know doesn't take up so much your wall, that's a great spot as well. They ship with everything to mount, power, and dim. Every sign is easy to install and operate. Go to SaturdayNeon.com. Use the code DNVR for 10% off your order today. Free shipping for orders over $200. All right, keeping it moving. I want to get to some of these questions and comments. Let me drink some water here. My voice is dying. All right. A couple of final thoughts. And you guys get some questions in, get some comments in. Um, do you think if Horton has a slow finish to the season with injuries, it may influence him coming back? Great question, CD Sticks. Um, I don't... <laughs> I don't want to get people's hopes up. I will say, I think the possibility of Tory coming back is much greater than most individuals in that situation. For one thing, he's only 21 years old. There's not a big rush. His family loves, and I mean loves, Jay Norvell. I also think that Tory is good enough. If he comes back for another year, and lights it up. He is good and athletic enough to play his way into the first round. It's not a guarantee, but the difference between the money in the first and the third round is pretty significant. So we'll have to monitor monitor this as it goes on. I do think you know if he continues to to get beat up, maybe you reassess the situation and ask yourself, hey, should I be risking this now? Should I just you know go to the pros when I have the opportunity? But I don't know. I mean, you went out here, get some positive momentum rolling. I really do think that there's a better chance that he and Holker come back next year than most people would would potentially anticipate. Again, not trying to get everybody's hopes up prematurely or anything like that. But I mean, going even going back to July, Tori has unpromptedly brought up the fact that I have another year of eligibility. I'm not necessarily leaving. Now, if he gets word that he's going to be a first round or maybe even a second round pick. I think you got to go. I think there's just too much money at stake and it's just hard to walk away from that. NIL has made things a little more interesting, especially for a guy like Horton. We'll see. We'll see. Great, great question though. Um, I'm going to keep it going with some final thoughts. If you guys have anything you want me to respond to, go ahead and keep it rolling. A uh, comment from Taylor here. Oh, or Allen, I guess I should say. No way Horton and Kamara coming back. Both are drafted in the first two rounds. Well, Mo's out, out of eligibility, so he could not come back. He's a fifth-year player. Tory does have an, another year of eligibility if he chooses. I, he would not go in the first two rounds right now. He wouldn't. It, it's not because of talent. It just has to do with how many really good receivers there are in this class, and it's kind of like that every year. But, I mean, Roma Dunze... Uh, you look at Keon Coleman of Florida State. There, there are some serious, serious guys. Now, I will say Torrey's as athletic as any of them, and I think he is absolutely nasty, uh, but you never know. Question from Jacob Kennedy. Any chance McAllister from Boise would come to the fort? You never know. I'm guessing that based on the timing of his announcement, McAllister already has a Power 5 school in the waiting. Given the way that he left... It really seems like somebody's been in his ears for a while. According to BJ Reigns of Bronco News Nation, I think TCU is kind of the, the the rumored school here. A question from AO. Justin, appreciate your coverage. Was curious about the CU rivalry. In my opinion, it should be played every year, but the schedule is filled up the next few years. Can it still be played every year? Yeah, it uh, it absolutely should be an annual game. 
gets kind of complicated, especially with uh, the, the different formats within conferences. When CU's in the Pac-12, they're only playing three non-conference games. There is an argument that you know they want to play higher profile games. I don't know. But at, at the end of the day, it's a game that everybody locally cares about. It generates interest in the sport, which is huge. It, it's really stupid that CU chose to not have this be annually, but uh, we will play in Fort Collins this next year. Then they'll be off for a couple years. Then they'll play for four years and off for two years. It's I'm glad that it's it's still going to be in the mix. But yeah, it's it's absolutely asinine that this game's not played every year, really in every sport. <laughs> I, I just think we need a, a little common sense when it comes to college athletics, especially in a state like Colorado, where if we're being real, you know, you're always playing second fiddle to the pro sports. So anytime you can generate interest in your in your sport, why wouldn't you do it? It seems pretty simple to me. Question from Taylor. Uh, we were watching the first half of the pod, but did you talk about the Patty Turner getting another muff punt? Dude is playing so well this season. I had not brought that up yet, Taylor, so I'm glad that you commented it. A real knuckler that was brutal on that returner. Big heads up from Hen- Henry Blackburn to fall on that ball, get the recovery. Patty has really been effective. He did shank one after that, which was unfortunate because <laughs> I was set to to hype him up, Patty the batty. I really love that guy. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I am biased when it comes to Patty Turner just because I think he's such a good dude, but also I think he gets a bad rep because people, frankly, just don't understand what he's trying to do with those rugby bunts. He's not trying to kick a 75-yard booming punt 99% of the time. They're just trying to to flip the field and avoid returns. A 35 to 40-yard punt with no return is not a loss necessarily. I mean, there are times where you'd like it to be more like 40-45, but, you know, Patty's my guy. So I'm always going to have his back. Uh, comment from Michael Moore. Glad we finally get a game in Fort Collins against CU. Amen. Amen. Glad they're finally not ducking us, not so soft that they won't come to Fort Collins. We're supposed to go in 2020, but we all know how that went. 2020 robbed us of so many fun opportunities. CU was coming to Fort Collins. CSU was supposed to play in Vegas and Allegiant Stadium, which at the time was. Still new and exciting. They were supposed to go to Nashville for that game with Vandy. And man, just so many missed opportunities. RIP. A comment from Andy here. BFN needs to use his legs to open up more options. Yeah, there, there have been a couple of times actually, you know, watching the game the other night or last night, uh, my girlfriend was actually commenting on that, just being like, why didn't he run there? You know, take two, three yards and, instead of, you know, taking zero on a throwaway. There, there are some times, um, you don't want him getting blown up. You know, he he did take some shots last year. Want to keep him upright. But I do think that is an element of his game that could help him at times. And if you can get the, the running game going more consistently with this uh, stable of backs, that's obviously going to help things as well. Uh, getting some of those underneath, you know, dump out plays where you just kind of dump it to a receiver on the sideline. He makes, makes guy miss. Um, there's a lot of things they can do to kind of open it up, but BFN definitely could use his legs more. That is one of many of them. Um, Still too many penalties. I I will say that the unsportsmanlike conduct penalties, which typically those are the ones that are going to make you the most mad. I didn't, I didn't think either of them was that big of a deal. Gardner gets called for one for spiking the football after a touchdown. Come on, come on. You can do a choreographed dance in some instances and not draw a flag. Like like CU did against CSU, but if you do the Dion dance, you're you're gonna get a flag. If you spike the ball, apparently it's a flag. It's so inconsistent. It's so dumb. I guess you could argue just don't spike the football. But guys are fired up. They're playing hard. They're just trying to have fun, man. Like I'm not gonna rip a guy for that. The other unsportsman, like I believe, was on Drew Moss and a uh, San Diego State defenseman, defensive lineman. He's flexing, standing over one of I believe it was the long snapper because it was on an extra point. You know, trying to start stuff with him. Gardner comes in, gives or uh, Moss comes in and gives him the business a little bit. Like I don't have a beef with guys standing up for their teammates. I don't have beef with spiking the football. It's not like you know he did the worm out there, or something crazy excessive. I, I just think you got to look at every situation individually and assess it. The face mask penalties were really frustrating defensively. I think those were those were the ones that that frustrated me the most because one was on a two point conversion. 
One was on a, a tackle for loss that should have set up like third and 13. I mean, yes. Is it frustrating that you had over a hundred yards and penalties, but as CD sticks says here, I will take penalties. If it means the team is playing with passion. I remember when teams of the past looked like they wanted to be done with football by Halloween. Amen. Amen. Just the fact that these two games matter is exciting to me. Like I understand that this season to an extent has been a letdown with some of the missed opportunities, but they've also shown so much growth. And at the end of the day, we care about football in November for the first time in like five freaking years. Like, can you not at least appreciate that? That's all I'm saying. Yes. There are things they got to clean up. Yes. They let San Diego state hang around. But a win is a win, and the fight of this group is really admirable. I just I can't state enough how many times CSU would have lost this game over the years, even after going up. And I, I don't think any Ram fan felt super confident when they were up 10 points with eight and a half minutes left, just because we've seen this program blow those moments time and time again. They got it done. They got it done. Now, you're going to have to continue to, to execute. You got to take it one week at a time. You know Nevada's up for this game. Nothing would make those guys happier than to play spoilers and not allow Jay Norvell to, to make a bowl game. Games on the island, also always wonky. I mean, Hawaii thumped Air Force last night. It was more about how Air Force played. They just looked like a shell of themselves. Um, they, they got ball security issues all of a sudden penalties all of a sudden injuries have cost them um but i I just i'm I'm bringing this up because while you are playing two objectively bad teams there's some wonky circumstances with these matchups that make you just a little bit nervous given the fact that you need to win out to make a bowl game uh appreciate you taylor in the comments get healthy j mike b-ball ramping up football in the home stretch needs out there i i will be back in person as soon as i can i I hate being remote. I really do. I just there's so many things you can't see from the the TV broadcasts that are really important when it comes to the context of a play and, and breaking all this down. So I'll definitely be there in person anytime that I can. Don't want to expose the team though. I mean, I'm actually shocked I've been able to go this long without coughing. It's probably the longest I've gone in two and a half days <laughs> on this broadcast. Uh, but they just they gotta finish strong here. They got to finish strong. This team is too talented to miss the postseason again. And I think they played well enough to make a bowl game. The schedule ended up being really weird. A lot of teams were better than I expected. A couple were not as good as I expected. And that kind of evened out in the middle. But playing for for a bowl game is really what all of us hoped for coming into the year. That was the expectation. That was the hope. You hope that the offensive line would be able to be much improved. They have the defense up and down over the course of the entire year, but they've, they've played well enough down the stretch here to give CSU a shot. And they've just got to find enough with this offense, with the ground game, special teams will hopefully continue to be a strength. Made a couple field goals, get the the recovered muff punt. It's all there for the taking. It's all there. And if you can find a way to get into a bowl, it's just huge for the development of your program. You get an extra month of practice, which inherently just sets you up in a better spot going into winter workouts, which sets you up for better success going into spring ball. It's all a cycle. Like these best teams, it's because they're they're always working together. And when you go three and nine and your season's over by mid-October, you know, you're basically going two months where the the program is is not locked in. And I just think they need to do it. They got they got to find a way where a handful of plays away from being like seven, seven and four, as we're seeing in the, the comment section here. And that's indicative of a young team that had to, you know, have some lumps, have some growing moments. But at the end of the day, it's there for the taking. If they can go out, if they can get to a bowl and, and win a bowl, you don't just want to get there. You want to win one. If you could close out this season on a four game winning streak, I think that would feel pretty dang good after what we've been through over the last half decade. So. I'm really excited. Just the fact that we have football in November that that matters is something that I've craved for a really long time. I have higher aspirations down the line. I want to see the Rams win a conference championship before I'm 50. But I also understand 
that it takes time. And I believe in what this staff is doing. I think they have quality coaches that are both, you know, brilliant from a football perspective, but also good individuals. And I think you're starting to see some of these young guys really pop on both sides of the football. Marshawn Oxley in the defensive line. You can look at a guy like uh, Boom Jock and Newer Gatkuth and TJ Crandall in the secondary. Justin Marshall at running back yesterday. You've got sophomore receivers. I mean, they are recruiting well. They have talent. They're doing the right things. They're consistently fighting. Now they just got to go out and execute over these last couple of weeks and you know, really definitively prove that they have made the most of this season, that they have taken their lumps and they've learned from it. Now, if you, if you lose out on a bowl game, that's really disappointing. Doesn't mean all of the, the positive. It doesn't mean my entire perspective changes. Oh, we didn't make a bowl game. Everything Justin said goes out the window. No, it means he came up a little bit short. But I do think it would be really, really huge for CSU to find a way to just get into that bowl. It's going to be something like the New Mexico Bowl. Not super sexy or anything like that. But a bowl is a bowl. A win is a win. And I'm proud to be, baby. At the end of the day, I'm proud to be. I'm excited to see the direction of this program under Jay Norvell. I'm excited to see these young guys continue to, to break out. And uh, hopefully they get it done. Hopefully they get it done. Back in Fort Collins next week, 1 p.m. kick. Amen. Hallelujah. Really nice to get an afternoon kick for once. Uh, great comment from the Oso Blanco. Good point on the offensive line. Crazy how much better they are than last year. It's night and day. Night and day. I mean, they, they were basically in the spot CU is in right now, which is having the worst offensive line in the country, especially when it comes to pass protection, to having a top 10 passing offense in the nation. I haven't checked the sack stats in a couple of weeks, but they've been like top 30 in sacks allowed for the majority of the year. I, I would think they're still in there. It's been awesome. It's been great to see. Shout out to Billy Best. Shout out to all of you for getting up with me, for tuning into this pod. The support that we get on this show, it, it just overwhelms me. And I really appreciate you guys. So it's going to be a fun couple of weeks here. Got some big basketball coming up. I have plenty of hoops content coming your way. Uh, assuming I can have my voice hold up, I'm actually going to rewatch uh, both basketball games from this week and uh, get a hoops pot out as well. But that might have to be Monday. We'll have to see again. On The Voice, uh, I appreciate everybody being understanding of my current condition. Tired of being sick, tired of coughing a lung up. I'm very, very delirious at the moment. You know that, like when you have a cold and your head just like you feel the pressure in your sinuses and I, I don't know, I, you guys don't care. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in. Uh, much love, y'all. Always proud to be. Enjoy your Sunday. Peace. Whoa. 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 Whoa.